The following presentation was recorded live for the International Association of Square Dance Callers 33rd Annual Convention. We take you live to the Renaissance Suites Hotel in Charlotte, North Carolina, where our session is just getting underway. My name is Dick Henschel. I want to thank you for coming to our uh, this session. Um, I'll be the moderator, and uh, Tom Dillander will be here with me, and he'll answer all your questions. Isn't that way we worked it out, Tom? That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, we're going to... Uh, both Tom and I both agreed that uh, we, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction, but we feel like the majority of the time for this session is going to be a question and answer period because we feel like we'll probably get a, a lot more at what people want to know. Uh, any questions that they have for us uh, will be the probably the most important part of the whole thing. Uh, for those of that you, I, I can't imagine anybody in square dance, dancing doesn't know Tom, but. Uh, Tom is, of course, the owner of Palomino Records, and if it wasn't for him, we probably wouldn't have any music, or at least very little. <laughs> so it's a pleasure being on the panel with him. My name is Dick Henschel. I've been a uh, caller for 31 years now and uh, been, uh, work for Hilton Audio Products, and my wife and I have owned Hilton Audio the last 19 years now. So... Um, like I said, the main thing is we're going to talk about uh, sound in general uh, in, pro in, in halls. I also brought a uh, handout sheet, which I have, I'll put out a little later, on uh, basic troubleshooting techniques. Um, it's one of those forearmed is uh, forewarned. I think it's a, a situation where if you just do a little bit of thinking ahead of time on possible problems that when they do occur and they will eventually at a dance for you, you're just uh, a little bit better prepared to handle that. Um, I think at this point what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn the mic over to Tom and he can do a little ideas on what he has and we'll go back and forth and then we'll get you guys involved in it. So here's Mr. Dillander. All right. Thanks, Dick. Um, not really sure why I'm here. I guess I've done 12 national conventions as far as sounding, and I guess some people think I know something about sound. Actually, I just know to buy good Hilton equipment and yak stack speakers and plug them up, and we're off and running. So uh, that, that's actually the secret to my success. Um, <laughs> you're right. Well, I guess it are half. I guess so. Um, real quick, I guess a couple of things. Uh, uh, the famous things are top tens. I have a top ten for you this morning. The top ten things you need to bring to your dance in terms of sound, okay? Number one, a spare needle. Yeah. Now, for those of you that don't use turntables, still bring a spare needle, okay? You'll find out why later. Number two, if I can find my list, an extra power cord. You don't know how many times carrying the, I should have brought my black box. I have a black box. It's over in the booth. If you don't believe me, come by the booth and I'll show you. I carry a black box. I'm not doing sound here. I still brought my sound box with me. It's got all these, th well, almost all these things in it. Don't quite have, it's not big enough to bring a turntable, but it's, anyway. Power cord. Bring the power cord. If you use more than one type of amplifier, you may have to bring two power cords. Hilton has at least three different power cords, depending on the model of turntable you have. Okay? You can bail yourself out by carrying an extra extension cord. That will take care of at least one of them. Okay? You can bring an extra computer power cable. That will take care of at least two of them. The third one, you're kind of on your own. That's one of those real unique ones with the little the old, yeah, type. Okay. Number three. A spare speaker cable. It can be a regular 16 gauge, 18 gauge, 12 gauge, quarter inch on both ends, whatever, special gauge. Or just an extra three foot shielded cable that comes with most type of wireless systems. Just a little three foot, dollar and a half, two dollars, whatever. That will bail you out so many times. Okay, that's number three. Number four, an extra microphone. doesn't have to be a $200 microphone, $500 microphone. It can be a $10 microphone from RS. Okay. <clears throat> a 
again, it's a backup, not your main one. Okay. Number five, a mic cable. Doesn't have to be one of these with the volume control and the resets. There again, it can be very inexpensive one from RS. Okay. Just as long as you've got one. Okay. Number six, if you're using something besides a turntable, like a mini disc player, bring a turntable. Bring a CD player. Bring a power source, something to plug into in case something else fails. If you're using CDs all the time, bring a spare mini disc player or bring a turntable, something to provide music to these people. They've come to the dance. They expect to have a dance. The excuse, oops, my MD's not working tonight. Oops, I broke it. Oh, I dropped it on the way in. Anything. Oh, it's not even in the box. It's not going to bail you out of that dance. Number seven, a spare power amp of some kind. A turntable, an MA150, a little 25 watt from RS, somewhere. Bring some kind of extra power. Okay? You can't rely on the church to have one in the back pew and go get it and unplug it and go use it for your dance. It's just not going to work that way. Okay? Where's my number eight? Actually, that was, both of those were number six. Last two. Number seven, or no, no, that's right, number seven, what's the power amp? Number eight, an extension cord. Just a plain old extension cord. Sometimes you get to the hall, and they set you up over here, and the plug's over here. It's your responsibility to get your turntable or your power system powered up. I got that marked as number eight, but I think that's number ten already. I think I went through all of them. Don't miss anything. Oh, number nine, batteries. Batteries. You may not need them for exactly what you were planning on using for your dance, but you might need them for your MD or your CD or your microphone that you weren't going to use that's the backup. It's not going to do you any good to have the backup system if you don't have the batteries that goes in them. And as good as we are about turning them off and putting them away, we invariably get it out, and it's turned on, and it's dead. Just a couple of bucks will bail you out. Okay, I think that's ten of them. Unless I missed one. That's ten. If that's not, if that's only nine, then bring a good attitude because you're going to need it too. I think that's ten. Okay, um, I'm going I'm to stop at this point because I know Dick wants to talk a little bit about some things here, and then I'm going to come back and talk about some speaker positions and a couple of things that will help you get the sound out to the floor, if that's okay with you. All right? Here's Dick. Yeah, that's uh, the key. There is uh, have backups, and uh, I know in my case, uh, like Tom, I have a I have an old duffel bag type thing that I've got cords and all my backup mic and everything in, and it's it's saved my bacon more than once. And uh, I don't know how most of you work, but I, I always drive the same car to my dances. If on that and it, 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 that. That bag just lives in my trunk. If it turns out you take more than one car, make sure you transfer it. <laughs> I've had that uh, happen with a friend of mine. So uh, just be uh, make sure you got your backups with you. You don't have to bring them into the hall, but just having them with you. So that, those are all real good points. Appreciate hearing. Um, we're going to be talking a bit about uh, sounding. Uh, they, they asked us to talk about sounding bigger venues. Uh, both Tom and I have been involved with sounding. Uh, nationals and festivals and it is different um, I just want to go over a few uh, hit on a few key points for those of you that are either thinking about sounding uh, festivals uh, and that can be any type of a local festival state festival or or if you want to get involved with a national at some point in time the the general idea is, is going to be the same one of uh, the, the starting point is always just your your pre-planning and um, if you're going to be doing sound or want to put in a bid for sounding for like a state convention or something like that, a big part of it is just uh, going to the facility and really taking some time to look the facility over. Um, I just can't emphasize enough how important that is. From that, everything else emanates. You're going to look at the facility uh, in terms of what equipment you're going to need, 
what the sound characteristics are in each of those rooms that, that are going to be used. Um, things that you might want to have changed, like uh, if a stage is set up in, in a spot that's going to make it awkward for running sound, is it possible for them to reset up the stage in a different uh, uh, location, that type of thing? Um, speaker placement is probably the most single important thing because uh, you really need to look at each hall and how you're going to set up your speakers and how many you're going to need, how you're going to hook them up. Uh, when I look at a building, the main thing is figuring out how many speakers you can figure out later on how you're going to actually hook them up as far as what cords and Y connectors and that type of thing you need. Um, special requirements. Occasionally you get into uh, a facility that just doesn't lend itself to uh, using a, a standard stand uh, with your speaker on it. Uh, you might have a facility that you have to look at maybe putting it on a balcony or something like that, and it might require uh, something very special to do that. So that's the type of thing you want to be looking for when you're going through a facility, uh, looking at that type of thing, pre-planning. Um, then after that, after you get back, oh, and another thing is when you're in the facility, it's a real good idea if you can have your mic equipment and patch in and, and, and set up a speaker and actually listen to it. That's an ideal situation, particularly if you're thinking of using the house sound system at all. Uh, as Tom and I can tell you, some sound systems and built into facilities are wonderful. The majority of them just don't work for square dancing. And uh, if you're thinking at all of using the house sound system, you better hook into it and find out 100% whether it's going to work for you or not. Sure. A comment on that. Um, it also has to do with the type of dance you're doing. I went into a clogging convention one time and set up sound. Those folks make a lot of noise with their feet. And invariably, I don't care how much sound I was throwing at them, they just wasn't hearing it. So there was house sound in the facility, and we said, well, let's, let's find out. I ended up putting the music through the house sound coming down on top of their heads and piping the vocal, the cues, out my speakers directly at their head. And it worked great. One of the few times I was able to do that. So sometimes you can work both of them out. But it did pay off. But I was getting nowhere. I mean, they were just drowning everything out until we used the house sound. And it worked great bringing it right down over top of them for the music only. Sometimes you can split it. Sometimes it works. Not very often, We're, our ears want to hear the music and the calls at the same time on a square dance floor. Be a little disorientated if we did that for square dancing, but it worked great for the clogging group. That's a good point. Um, you got to look at uh, the particular situation for sure and, and, and how it fits the given hall. Um, invariably, you're going to run into problem halls. Uh, we can go in, I think, probably when we get into the discussion. I just want to mention a, a few points. If you're in a facility and say one of the halls is just absolutely terrible as far as if you clap your hands and 10 minutes later you still hear the clap rattling around in there, the number one thing is try not to use the hall. Is there another option? Is, uh, are there enough in, uh, rooms in the facility that you can cancel out using one of the halls? Um, Sometimes the, the prettiest halls in terms of looks, oh, this is a beautiful hall. It's got horrible acoustics, so I'd rather dance in a hall that didn't look very good, but at least you could hear the caller or cure. So keep that in mind. Uh, speaker placement and number of speakers becomes very, very important. Uh, the, the, the more marginal, I guess you could say, the sound is in a given room. Um, uh, number of speakers... How you position them becomes super important as you get into there. There are certain halls that we've probably all been in. You couldn't mess it up no matter what you did. I mean, there are some halls with good acoustics that uh, you go in there and throw anything up on the table and away you go and the dancers are going to hear you. Uh, when you're thinking and looking at halls, for uh, particularly for a larger venue, um, it's the problem ones that you got to spend all your time thinking about how you're going to work around. Speak, speaker placement, how many speakers. Uh, when you have a very, very bad uh, hall that's acoustically, 
your best acoustical treatment in the whole hall is going to be the dancers. Keep that in mind. Point your speakers to where they're going to be hitting into the dancers. Uh, that will dancers, particularly in a full hall and in a hall that's had bad acoustics, if you point your speakers into the dancers, they, they make wonderful acoustical treatment and hopefully you get more in there. The more in, the more acoustical treatment, the better the sound will be. So that's a, a good point to keep in mind. Uh, also, when you have more speakers in a hall that has bad acoustics, it, it kind of sounds like it's going against the grain, but sometimes you can end up with better sound because you don't have to push each individual speaker as hard. So keep that in mind. Um, also, firing the speakers the shortest distance that you can going across the hall rather than the long way. You don't have to push the individual speakers as hard. Keep that in mind. That's one of the things to think about. Work with your tone controls. Make sure that uh, uh, the voice is standing out highly above the music. You might have to have the uh, emphasize to the callers and cures to run their music maybe a little bit lower than they normally do in a bad hall so that their voice stands out. Those are some of the things you want to think about in, in a problem hall. And uh, let's see. At this point, I think I'll... Tom, did you have a couple more points? A uh, couple of things. Um, an inexpensive thing that you can buy and take if you're using big halls, these little laser pins that you can get, only about three bucks. If you can get one of those, especially if you're in long, narrow halls, you put your speaker on a stand, if you can put that laser pin at the middle of the speaker, whether it's a column like this or a double or whatever, if you can put it in the middle and get that to aim to the corner floor in the back of that hall, it's not perfect, but it's about as close as you're going to get to provide sound in that hall. That is the angle you want. The worst thing you can do is have a real long hall and you have the speaker sitting here or even a double like this at this level and you're blasting the front two, three squares. I mean, their faces are just peeled back and the people in the back aren't hearing anything. Okay. You've got to get it up. And if you're going to get it up, you've got to get it on some angle. Now, it's not perfect, but I have found that the best estimate I can get to is by using that laser pin or eyesight. The laser pin takes out part of that. Is shooting to that corner, to the back of that hall, to the floor of that back of the hall. Gets you the best angle. Uh, now, if you're in a hall that's only 40 feet deep or 50 feet deep or 60 feet, it's not going to matter. These most all the speakers that are used in, t in today's environment handle 40, 50, 60 feet before they start deteriorating any at all. So it doesn't work too bad that way. But if you're in, if you're in a long haul, you've got to get that angle. You have to. You've got to get it down there. Um, I made another point here. Um, oh, if, if I had to call a dance in this hall here, even though it's a very small room, I would not want to have my stage or my equipment set up here. I would want on that wall back there. Now, this is going to be a little different for some of you, but to me, the worst thing I could have happen in this room is traffic in and out that doorway all the time, bothering those folks in the back square. And if I'm set up back there, most of my sound is starting from that corner coming this way. These folks back here aren't going to have a problem. Same way in a big hall. If I can set up nearest the entrance, or nearest where most of the traffic is flowing, I've given the squares in the back of the hall the better chance of hearing everything going on. Now, that's a little contrary to some of the setups you see. You know, I try to get my input in, but it don't always happen. And I'll work with whatever they give me. But if I have the option, I'm going to be where all the noise is for my equipment. Because they're not going to drown me out. They're not going to drown the sound out. But if you're on the opposite end, those folks in the back don't have a chance. With all the noise coming in and all the chatter, and we know where the weaker squares dance at, let's give them the best chance we can. So it's just something to think about. Um, one other little thing about speaker placement that I have learned, and I know we're all a little bit lazy, or I'm lazy, I'll do probably not, I'm lazy. One of the things I won't do, I won't come into a hall even this size and set my speaker on a table. Now, I don't have a, believe it or not, I don't have a record with me. Um, if I was going to set, if I had to set the speaker on this table, I would set it a little further out to this edge. If I took it back here, I'm not sure this is going to work real good, and without music it's going to be difficult, 
I probably lost 20% of the sound out of this column. Said, no, no way. There is so much sound coming down right here that we're losing. Or it's getting bounced and not effective for us. If, you're, if you have a habit of putting on the table and you're running your table the other way, long ways, you know, like this here, you set your turntable here and you got your speaker back here, change. Change today. The dancers are going to appreciate you so much more. You're losing so much sound if you move that speaker back on this table anywhere. Even this two foot makes a dramatic difference on how much is coming out of this column. So if you're doing that, start tomorrow. Make that change. You will hear a big difference. I'll put it back in here where it belongs. Yeah. It's not so much on the voice side, but on the music side, it's really going to make a major impact. And that's it. I just uh, I had one other thought when you were talking about placement as far as being by a door and everything. Um, sometimes in large facilities, you'll have... Um, uh, I know we used to set up in, in a very large facility that the dancers always came on in on one end of the hall. And uh, naturally, people, once the dance starts, people come in and they square up right where they come in. So what would often happen, even though it was a very huge hall, we'd end up with, um, you know, 80% of the people would be on one half of the hall. And in those situations, it's probably a good idea. If, if you know ahead of time that this is going to be happening, then that's the way the f people filter in. Set up your sound system with a slave so that you can uh, provide more sound for that area where people are filtering in. And then as the dance moved on and the people move slowly across the hall as the dance moved on, then you can bring up your, your second uh, stage and, and get the right volume because if you don't do that, if you're driving real hard to make sure that this half where the people have come in the door are being covered and you're driving this empty half just as loud, you're going to be creating a lot of reverb for and sound bouncing around that's, that's not going to help your environment and everything. So that's one of the things when you look at a facility and, and a particular hall to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, just one real quick little thing. Um, they asked us to talk a little bit about the Williams sound enhancement systems. Um, the key thing, uh, there, there's only a couple of key things. I, I set a, a Williams set up 90% uh, of the time when I do dances. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of things. Number one, you have a voice most, uh, I mean, a choice most of the time of transmitting voice only or voice and music. In my experience, I transmit voice only, and I'm a big believer in transmitting voice only. Uh, occasionally, people say, no, they should have some music too. But in my working, the more hearing impaired a person is, if they're going to square dance, they have to have your voice. Uh, they'll pick up enough of the, uh, the they can you know, almost feel the bass beat to move to that. So... Um, be careful when, if you are starting to use a Williams or a Telex sound enhancement system, be a little bit careful about the people who come up and say, no, I also want music on it. Well, they might be able to get by with it, but if you have somebody out there that has a very severe hearing problem, transmitting voice is what's important. So that's number one thing. Number two is the transmitters, both Williams and Telex makes, are exceedingly flexible as far as what you hook them into. You can hook them into almost anything, not damage the transmitter, and, uh, and have good results as long as you get it adjusted correctly. So those are my main thoughts there, and I'm sure you guys have other questions and all. And if Tom doesn't mind, at this point, I'd like to, to open it to the floor for any questions that are available, and we do have a nice wireless mic to pass around. Please make sure you, uh, you use the wireless mic. Hang on. One quick one on the uh, hearing enhancement. Dick made the comment that they're very flexible. You hook them in. Do the hookups yourself. Don't allow the dancers just to walk up and start plugging in. I have blown amps. I didn't personally blow it. They blew it. They'll plug it into the first hole they find. And it's not always the right one. So... Say, hey, I'll take care of that. You know, you go back there and, and you tell me when it sounds good and we'll be there, okay? But make sure you do the hookups, okay? Good point. Okay, and do we have some questions? Mr. Asp. Sure. My name is um, I'm Bob Asp. Um, when you hook up these enhancements, a lot of people 
you got a high input, high out or low input on the back of your Hilton. Mm -hmm. And then on the front, you got your music in, music or voice in, voice out. Is it better to hook it up to the voice in, voice out on the front of the turntable or come out to the back where it's got the high input or high output or low output? Right. Uh, because I like to transmit voice only, uh, any of the sound systems that have a voice only capability, that's what I would do. Uh, specifically on Hilton's, when you're talking about the high and the low off the back, that's picking up exactly the same signal as is going to your speaker. So it's going to have music m mixed in. And that would be very, for me, very much a, a second choice. It wouldn't definitely not be my first choice. Um, on some of the older systems, like the older 300s that have a monitor channel, you can hook the, um, uh, the Williams. Personally, I've never seen any problem with this, hooking the, uh, the, the Williams directly into the monitor speaker jack. I've never seen them cause a problem. Uh, that's, I've, I've heard a couple people tell me that they've had problems, but I've never seen it. The, the other thing with hooking up on the front part, particularly with the newer models, make sure you've made the adjustment on the gain. The worst thing you can do is hook a hearing enhancement system up and they get absolutely nothing and you're turning it up and you're turning up and the caller is getting louder and everything's getting louder and you didn't have the gain turned up at all. Okay, you, that's part of your job. Okay, in the newer models, the little black knobs for where the inputs are um, and the outputs, uh, particularly the outputs since you're wanting the signal to go to the hearing enhancement, uh, the older models, it's built in. Your, the gain is already preset. It's, it's going to be determined on how much mic output. You, know, you get a real soft color. In there. They're not going to hear a lot. They're going to hear as much as everybody else hears. Okay? But with the, with the newer controls, you can actually give that hearing package a big boost that the regular people are not hearing. Okay? In other words, everybody understand what I'm saying is the fact that they've got the volume control in the mic. That's one. But if they're plugged into the output and they have the black knob for the gain, you can boost that a lot louder than what the caller is calling. You know, they are hearing impaired. We've got to give them as much signal as we can. doesn't mean we turn it all the way open, but we do have more boost there that's built in for that. Also, the, uh, the transmitters themselves usually have an adjustment on. A lot of the times it's a screwdriver type of an adjustment, but... Uh, and there's usually a, a visual indication of an LED or something that's going to show you when you're transmitting a good signal. And obviously the best thing to do is uh, get Fred, who's got the hearing enhancement, have him out there and say, give me some signals when it's... Uh, I do that every Wednesday night. I got one fellow. I, he goes to the back of the hall. And I, I tweak it a little bit, and he gives me a thumbs up, and he's good to go for the night as long as his battery doesn't run out. Okay. That's right. That's that spare battery Tom was talking. If you've got it, you're the hero in case his battery runs out. Okay, Bob. Bob Jones, Troy, Ohio. Uh, you're speaking about this gain. Now, is this also with the computers that are now hooking to our 500? Do we hook it there so we can turn that gain up on that computer? Yeah, well, we're, we're switching from outputs to inputs because when you're talking with the sound enhancement, of course, you're, you're sending a signal to the transmitter, whereas when you're using a laptop or any type of a music input, you're matching it to the, uh, the input. Newer, newer systems have a, uh, a gain control to match up with it. Keep in mind also, your computer has a volume control. Tom and I were just talking about that the other day. He had a you know, we occasionally get a call from, I can't get any volume out. Well, did you turn up your computer's volume control? And there's silence for a little while. You know, so, what's that? Okay. So uh, you make sure if you're using a computer, an iPod, whatever you're using, make sure you understand how the system, that system works too. Uh, but to, to answer your question, Bob, um, uh, when you set up your computer, uh, just make sure you've got your volume set uh, roughly 80, 90 percent, or you, you can run it all the way up. And, and on all of the laptops I've worked with, I've never seen one that went into any distortion or anything. And then, then match it into your sound system. Well, I must be the only one that's had that big. When a guy comes over, I've got everything set for the convention. He walks over to do his tip, and he plugs his computer in, and my turntable goes. Rawr! 
No, that doesn't sound good. Uh, it's only on the laptops that I've been experiencing it. And I didn't know, and he was hooking into the front. And I didn't know whether we need to move him to the back. Okay. No, he, he definitely needs to. Now, a couple of things. He may have his stuff cranked up so hot, and you may have to adjust your gain down so low okay. to compensate for it. That's what I want to find you know, out. Usually the opposite occurs. Usually nobody records loud enough. They're afraid to get it too hot. They're afraid it's going to clip. And so they record it so low, and they plug it in. And you're taking everything all the way open and still not getting enough. Sounds like just the opposite right. happened. Okay. Um, gosh, something popped in my head when you said that earlier about the, um, the computer. But I'll come back to it uh, later. I want to think of it. <laughs> you have plenty of time, Tom. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, come on. I'm sure you guys got a lot of questions. Oh, hang on. Tom, Tom just had the, the, the bulb went on. The light came on. In your, speaking of computers, one of the problems that a lot of people have run into is there is more than one output. Just like in a lot of the sound cards, there's more than one input. You have the mic and the line. Sometimes you need to check both of them. One of them can be better than the other, and it's not always the line input. I have had computers, the sound card, the microphone line was better for recording purposes than the line. Not too often, but I have run into it on some computers. And you get these people that are panicking, oh, my line output's just not giving me the signal I want. Try the other one. It's amazing. Now, why, I can't explain. Different manufacturers, but you do need to test both of them. Yeah, and some of the cures, I don't, I'm not sure that they're aware of that either because I wasn't aware of that, what you just said about that. Uh, good, good point. Yeah, knowing, uh, uh, making sure you know how your, uh, your computer's volume and uh, record controls, particularly for recording, yeah, that's another thing is, is sometimes people don't understand that their, their sound card on their, on their computer, you got to adjust the volume on that. And you also got to select that sometimes people, I'm, I'm going, I know I'm going into it with a signal, but I'm not getting any recording. Sometimes that's a matter of uh, they've got it checked and not checked as one of the uh, acceptable uh, inputs. Now I know why they call them sound technicians. You got to know everything. Well, one of the other things is, and we're all guilty of this, I think, is we try to put as many devices into the amp that we can. And we do that with Ys, a little bitty Ys. Some of them are parallel. Some of them are series. Some of them cut the signal in half. Some of them cut them completely off when you unplug one or the other. This is not something you learn at the dance. Well, you can. It's not recommended, okay? And, and but, you know, I have many a caller that has a mini disc and a CD player, both, or a laptop, hooked in to the Hilton at the same time and expect the same signal when he turns any of them on. Well, you can do that, but you've got to work at it a little bit. You just don't grab the stuff out of your box, plug a Y in here, plug this cord in here, plug this one in here, and turn it on. Okay, you've got to work with that stuff a little bit. You can't. It's no different than working with this microphone and that microphone over there in the same output. Okay. Yes, you can get them to sound alike, but you better do a little work on the receiver end of that wireless. Okay. One of the worst things I saw, I went to a dance one time. Caller was up doing the dance. Cure came up. Ooh. They were so mismatched, it took... Ten, five or ten minutes to get everything corrected. Well, that time everybody was ticked off and not, didn't want to do any more dancing because it was really hurting their ears. You've got to work a little bit. You've got to spend a little bit of time setting this stuff up in advance. You've got to spend a little bit of time on it, and it'll really pay off. The other thing I was going to mention on the top ten, this is not only for yourself to carry this stuff. It's just in case you've got somebody else that's going to call a dance with you or a call tip with you. You're the hero if something about their stuff isn't any good or doesn't work, and you've got the spares. You're the hero. Okay. Uh, it's the worst thing you can do is invite a caller to get up and do a tip, and he goes and gets his microphone, and as he gets ready to plug it in, you see bear wires. Okay. I know we've seen it. I know you've seen it. Do you want him to plug that in? 
I don't want him to plug it into my set. Hey, by the way, I got a new cord here. Try this one out. Okay? Don't want him plugging it into my set. This stuff is worth its weight in gold if you start carrying it. Okay? Also, like Tom said, you can often be the hero. I uh, <clears throat> happened to have that situation a, uh, a few weeks ago myself where I was at a dance and uh, caller's computer wasn't working. Uh, and uh, luckily, there were three other callers at the dance, and between us, we scrounged up a whole bunch of records, a uh, MP3 player, and a few things that the dance went off, no problem at all. But uh, uh, so, half backups, okay. It's, I, I don't think we can emphasize that one enough for sure, particularly whatever your music source is. If you're particularly uh, so much, uh, so many of us are going through a transition from one medium to another. Uh, if you're transitioning into like a laptop or, or using CDs, make sure you've still got enough uh, uh, whatever you've been using in the past uh, tucked away in the trunk of your car at, le at the bare minimum that you can grab real quick and get back and going if, if something happens. Uh, I'd like to have a little bit of explanation on uh, placement of speakers. Say you're doing a weekend, 15, 20 squares, if you're lucky. You're in a fairly decent hall, and you need just that little bit of extra in the back. You always have those 10 or 15 dancers that say they can't hear. And they said, well, in the last dance we were at at Tony Oxidine, they put a speaker in the back, a single yak. Is that is that appropriate to do, run a double in the front and a single in the back, or maybe set it up in the attic and shoot down on them? Um, you know, I mean, you hear all these nightmares out here, what we do. Let's split the yaks and let's put four singles down this wall here uh, and maybe two singles down that wall over there and sound it this way and this way. I mean, you hear all this stuff. A couple of key things. Number one, I don't, I don't believe in ever mixing different types of speakers. Because what it does, anytime you have two different types of speakers, and I'm not talking in terms of the quality of the speakers, just having two different speakers, you have turned some of your dancers into sound experts, <laughs> guaranteed. Because they will notice that one speaker doesn't sound like the other speaker, which is always the case. It doesn't matter if they're the same manufacturer, even if they're, if they're different generations or different uh, ones. Uh, it's amazing. You'll see two or, got two or three of the guys out there saying, man, that's what, man, this one sounds different from that one over there. And you put doubt in dancers' minds. So please, whatever you do, if you do use extra speakers, try as much as possible to stick with the same type of speakers, number one. To, to get to your question, uh, I, there's, we have uh, over the years set up uh, many times where we've shot from the back forward. Uh, when we do it, we have always set up mirror image. So if there's two in the back, you got two in the front, and they're the same type. If you're talking about a dance with 20 or 30 squares, there are very, very few situations where you would need to do that. Uh, I, I, I would emphasize you need to get the speakers probably up a little bit higher so that you can drive them a little harder without, as Tom was saying earlier, blasting the people out in the front. Mainly this comes from the round dance cure, you know, because he's, he, he's the sound expert there and been there. I, I think a lot of that has a lot to do with, with, I know they have music and I know they have sound, but I think it's different types there. I don't know whether it's the speed of the call or, or what's, what's making it sound different. That cure, when he walks that room, he says, Bob, you need to split those yaks up in the front. You need four across them behind you and two on that side. Single yak, I mean split them in half. And I, I, I just cannot see that. Sounds like a salesman from yak. <laughs> <laughs> Sell more speakers that way. First thing I would do is tell the dancers to move up front. First thing. Hey, you're having trouble hearing, move up front. You know, and, and Dick alluded to it, they're the experts. They can, they can tell you, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and then most of the time, they're right. Most of the time. Um, the second thing I would do is lower my level of calling. Usually, my question usually be, cure sound real quick in most halls. I guess to get to the bottom of it, do you, do you recommend splitting the X singly? If, you got 15, if you're talking 15, 20 squares, no, I wouldn't. I would definitely know. There's no, the, the speaker design is made to shoot 30 to 40 feet side to side and 60 feet before it falls off anything at all. There's no reason to split anything, you know. Somebody needs to turn the hearing aids up a little bit. <laughs> but no, I, in that case, no, I wouldn't. I, I, I wasn't there, you know. But you know, yeah, and, know and, and it's kind of like troubleshooting over the telephone when we get some calls. You know, we, we do our best. 
But no, I don't split a set of yaks or any speakers unless I absolutely have to. I will go up. I'll go up a foot at a time. Okay, and then and, and then again, I'm not going to go 12 foot in the air for a 20 square ball. Okay, but I will go up. I'll go up way before I even think about splitting. Because when you split speakers, I don't care how good they are, whether they're bows, jacks, hilton, what they are, at some point they're going to conflict. They're going to cross over. There's some cancellation going on. Not too much, but there's some. Why make it worse? I, I just wouldn't do it. Okay. Um, we have found that oversound is most of the problem. Too much. We have found in a lot of halls, unplugging in the bottom half of a double yak improves the sound. Had too much to start with. Yeah, in a bad hall, in a bad hall, a double is bad. It's worse. Unplug. Don't tell them. Hey, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Act like you're making some adjustments on the knobs or whatever. And reach over there and plug the bottom half. The front squares are going to appreciate you a whole lot more. But there is no science. Yes, you, it, there, it, there's a blueprint, and it's all scientifically engineered. But every single hall, every environment is different. You have to work with it a little bit. Do listen to the dancers. Take their, you know, don't say, hey, I know what I'm doing. Just leave me up. Oh, yeah. Don't yes, go back yes. and dance. You know, that's the worst thing you can do. Be appreciative of the information. Act like you're twisting some knobs. They'll, they'll think it improved, you know. But usually... Usually just taking some of the sound away or lowering the level, politely saying, hey, would you move up front? You know, let me watch. Let me help you out a little bit. One, except, one exception, personally, I would say, is if you're in a hall that is uh, the stage is set up and it's very shallow across the hall, but it's a very wide hall. In those case, cases, I, I would split them personally, um, just to even out the sound over the hall. Uh, but like Tom said, every hall, you got to look at every hall. But one of the things, too, I think, is you have to be a, a certain amount of confidence in, in what you're saying. You're saying if somebody comes in and says, no, you got to do this, 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 and this, well, if you were if you were the one hired to do the sound and, and do the uh, calling and everything, it's your job. And if you know you've got it set up right, I'm sorry, this is the way it's going to do it. You know, this is the way we're going to work with it and uh, try to work with the person. But uh, if somebody's got some uh, what I would call unusual ideas, I want to put two over here and four over here. And I'm, you know, it's okay, well, next time you can set it up, okay? Yeah. <laughs> There's been very few instances where I've ever seen it successfully work when you have a speaker back there looking at you at a dance. Doesn't mean it can't happen. Right. Alamant Hall set up that way, and they've been very successful over the years. It's an exception. Right. I was in a little place in Ohio. They have a little hall set up, and it's about twice the size of this room, and they've got a full yak hanging on the back wall. I thought, why in the world would they do that? they got a bunch of hard-to-hear people, and they feel better with it having it back there. I adjusted when I went and called my dance. I adjusted my sound a little softer than I normally would. They got to hear out of the back speaker like they wanted to. I didn't have to say, no, that's the wrong thing to do. The dance was fine. But most of the time, you want sound going in one direction. I personally do not like having a speaker here and halfway down the hall having another speaker. I've seen people do it, and I went into a dance oh, a couple weeks ago, and they wanted me to put another speaker halfway down the hall. I said, well, let me try what I'm going to use here first. Because to me, that's just a nightmare about to happen. You know? That uh, the situation Tom's describing is a great way to, to you've ger generated a time delay. I mean, you've, 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 got, you've created a problem where right. there probably wasn't a problem by putting a speaker partway down the hall. The only way to do that successfully, people will see it sometimes in churches and that type of thing. Sometimes churches will set up that way. What they don't know is the speakers are on a time delay. They, they've built a time delay into the line so that as the sound comes out of the front speaker, by the time that particular word reaches those 
halfway down speakers, that's when the sound comes out of those second speakers. You can do that, but it's almost always done in permanent installations. Uh, unfortunately, people will see that and say, well, it works great in my church, so uh, why wouldn't it work at the square dance? Well, unless you've got the proper equipment to set up time delays on speakers set further down, all you're doing is creating an, an echo. Because basically, for the dancers back there, what they're going to do is they're going to, because the sound comes out of the speakers at exactly the same time, they're going to hear the one speaker, and then a, a split second later, they're going to hear the front speaker for those that are in the back. And that's, uh, that's not good. We don't want to do that. Uh, the only time, uh, getting back to the whole idea of speakers at the back firing forward, the only time that we have done that personally at, at Hilton has been in very large halls. Uh, not the type of thing you're going to run into... Uh, I mean, you, you, if it's a hall where you're talking about they'll hold 120 squares, something like that, uh, sometimes you have to simply because of the, the distance you're going to be pushing the sound. But uh, uh, for most situations, when you're talking 20, 30 squares, I can't picture in an environment where you'd have to do that personally. Question back there. Uh, could uh, Bob, could you take on the mic? Thank you. Howdy. Bob Price. Uh, the uh, having the sound speaker in the back of the room, uh, I've seen that in you know, several locations or several times. And my question is, when you do that, uh, do you actually uh, reverse the polarity to those speakers to try to switch phase so they you know, come closer to being uh, in sync with each other? You know, I, I I agree that it's not a good idea to do that, but when it is done, I think you probably it is, want to... Yeah, it, to your question, yes. If you are going to do that situation, it is recommended the phase. Uh, I've, I've done it both ways. I've set it up. I've been in the middle of the hall. By the time the, the sound gets to the middle of the hall, I personally couldn't tell much difference. Uh, but every, every technical thing you read on it says, yes, uh, reverse phase it. Uh, for those of you that haven't been in that situation in a large uh, what you end up with is if you've got the volume set the same on the front and the back, and like I said, it's a mirror image, same exact number of speakers and driven exact same power, what you end up is in the middle of the hall you have a, an area where uh, you can hear both speakers. It's usually about you know, eight feet wide or so. And as soon as you step over that eight feet, you're heading to the front or the back, all you hear is those front or back speakers. And the people that you're going to get complaints for are those squares where as you move through the square, you're moving into hearing only the back one, into hearing both of them. Those people are going to be disoriented by the whole thing. The people that are in the, only hearing the back ones, the people that are only hearing the front ones, they're not going to have any problem. Uh, Bill Trelevin, I just uh, want to uh, discuss or have your comments on uh, buzzes and hums that show up once in a while. And I've had suggestions that it was a uh, problem with the hearing enhancement and uh, some of the cordless mics, some interference there. Um, perhaps uh, without stepping on anybody's toes, you could make a comment on last night's after party uh, sound thing there. I wasn't there either. Maybe it's a good thing we weren't, Tom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there are so many things that could cause buzzes and, and that type of thing. Uh, the, the key thing I always try to tell people is think about the simple things. Um, a bad patch cord. Um, setting up a wireless mic right next to a, um, uh, a sound enhancement transmitter. You know, you gotta, sometimes you got to physically isolate the two as far away from each other as possible. Push come to shove if it's a situation you're in where you're setting up on a regular basis, uh, using a multiple outlet strip that has uh, filtering built into it, and maybe you have to put uh, either the sound enhancement or the wireless transmitter on the, uh, I mean wireless uh, microphone receiver on it to isolate it from the rest of it. Sometimes those are the type of things you have to do. Uh, one of the things that we commonly have problems with, and in fact it, it happened to me when I first started using a computer, um, the, 
the brick power packs that come typically with most computers or laptop computers, if you have a three-prong uh, power cord on it, you usually have to switch it over to a two-prong adapter power cord because those power packs used with laptops are what we call switching power supplies, and they tend to be very noisy, and they tend to put noise on the ground line, which your sound system will pick up. Um, so you know, there's a lot of things. To, uh, one of the first things I would say when you have a buzz or something like that is figure out what, where it's coming from. See if your volume controls make any difference. What typically 90% uh, of the time I'd say you're going to find out like turning one of the microphone volumes up or down is going to affect it. Uh, also check the uh, on, on amps that have the smaller gain controls. Make sure those are turned down if they're not being used. Dick mentioned the power strip. That's one of the other most important things. I said an extra uh, extension cord. I didn't mean a lamp cord. I'm not talking about a good power cord strip. Circuit breaker on it, uh, closed loop system, filter. Spend 25 bucks. Buy a nice one. Buy something. These uh, wireless systems, if you put a CD player and a wireless microphone to next to each other, they put off, I call it RF frequencies, I don't know if that's a technical term for it now. They put off enough to be picked up. It's picked up. And it's going to get transmitted through this electric wires very quickly. Okay? If you can, he said isolate, if you can plug those in differently, doesn't mean you have to run a cord over here and run a cord over here necessarily, buy a good power strip. Okay? Now, there's also the 60 cycle hum, you're going to get some of that. And Dick mentioned a lot of times I've seen guys walk up in their microphones at 12 o'clock. You're going to get some noise, some noise you don't want. Okay, uh, so you do have to make some of those adjustments. Hopefully that answered your question at least a bit. Uh, but each situation is going to be separate. So one of the key things is just trying to run down what's causing it and then isolating that item. Uh, if there's several things hooked in, start unplugging them one at a time and figure out which one's causing the buzz. Okay. Any other questions? Real quick trick of the trade. Here's, a, here's one of my little tricks. See these little antennas up here? You don't need them. I've never been in a hall yet where having that antenna up did a thing for a wireless system. Now you may have. I'm probably going to get proven wrong since I mentioned it. But in 10 years, I have never, ever, ever needed antennas on a wireless system. Those things will pick up stuff you don't want. Don't open them. Leave them down. Those things are good for like 150 feet. Are you going to go 150 feet away and talk? Probably not. You're not going to hear yourself, let alone anybody else hear you. Okay? Don't need the antennas. Avoid problems. I try to avoid every little thing I can. Leave the antennas down. You might be surprised what you don't hear. Okay? That's a good point. Why, um, uh, near where uh, Hilton Audio Products is and where I call is uh, Benicia, which is, Benicia is a town that is uh, right on the, uh, where the Sacramento River comes into uh, uh, the north end of San Francisco Bay, and there's, there's always uh, major ship traffic going up and down through there, and right up on the hill overlooking the straits there is this beautiful hall that we use often, and uh, the people in there, if you use a wireless in there, you have to do like Tom says. You've got you to keep the antennas down because what happens is you'll have a boat coming through that's transmitting some signals, and, and you'll be picking it up and having all kinds of interference. You know, it took us a, a while to figure out what was going on with those, but it uh, uh, only happened at certain times, and there was usually a great big ship right up there when it was happening. So, <laughs> Next question, please. My name is John Ryan. I'm very green to all this, so my question is probably, you guys probably already know this, but when you're using like a, like a CD player into the turntable amplifier thing, should you turn the turntable thing off or leave it low or just keep it at the 45-ish thing? Or uh, If you're not going to be using the turntable, you might as well turn it off. I mean, there's no reason to have it on if it's not being used. It, it's not going to really hurt anything other than the fact that you uh, hear a little bit of noise, mechanical noise with the, with the motor running. But uh, 
Yeah, if you're using a CD or, or um, an iPod or whatever you're using, just leave the turntable turned off, sure. And my, my second question, if I could, I think you, Tom, is it? I think you maybe have answered it, but if I'm going to be using a, a wireless and a CD player, um, at first I wrote down, do, do a Y splitter, but then you suggested doing like the, the power strip and put it, plug them in individually. You Does may need matter? to. It, it's one of those Which things that you may or may not need to. But the key thing is being aware that you can have problems, particularly with a wireless and a CD, because uh, digital music, uh, a digital pr uh, like a CD, if you, t if you put a CD player right close or on top of, I, I, I worked with a, a line dance instructor who had a, uh, um, a, a dual CD player, and they had strapped their wireless receiver right on top, and they were having all kinds of problems. So we just popped that sucker off, put it about three feet away, and the problems went away. So you do, the, the key thing is, is just having the knowledge that this can cause a problem. And it's, it's not a permanent problem, and it's not going to hurt anything, but it's going to detract from your performance if you're getting that, that, that nasty little static sound coming through your wireless. So uh, if, if you separated them and you still have a problem, then definitely the next choice is to get a, um, a, a multiple outlet strip that has filtering and spike suppression built into it. Plug the power pack for your uh, wireless into it, have it isolated further away, and that should solve the problem almost invariably. Primarily the wise situation I'm talking about is when you're trying to put two inputs into one spot. That's usually where we're using the wise and not really comfortable with which ones we're using. Something I want to share with you, and, and it may never happen to you. Happened to us at the shop the other day. Um, we were in doing some recording, and I'd set up a, a very impromptu short-term situation where I had my speaker set up, and I had my computer sitting right next to it, my computer monitor. Two hours later, my monitor had no color on the screen. Magnetics. A lot of magnets in here. Be careful where you place your computers. I, 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 could have been a very could have been a fluke. I don't know. I don't want to recreate it. <laughs> Eventually came back. Yeah, but it was it went it went it went green. That's interesting. All right, Bob. Uh, long lines for this gentleman's question over here that was talking about the CD player. Uh, I had this, some guy come in and said, uh, let me call a guest tip. So he brought his own CD player in, and he was using the earphone output to hook into my turntable. Wow. You want to talk about the buzz. Hmm. Halfway through, you know, he's playing his CD. I mean, it just starts scratching. I mean, it sounds like a, a and he just keeps trying to get above it. I'm saying Get one that has a mic output if you got the small CD. Now, I'm not talking about this nice big one they got down here. I'm talking about this gentleman coming in carrying just a portable Walkman. And he said, I'm gonna, I got this CD. I'm going to hook it to my turntable on the earphone output. Uh, my comment on that would be, though, uh, with most small CD players, that works fine. Okay? Uh, coming out of the earphone usually works fine. Uh, so... I, my guess is he had something else going on, either well, the CD yeah, player. Yeah, you don't know about the condition of his cord, but well, the uh, cord and the CD player itself might have had a problem, but uh, or a wireless system. Yeah, it, they, yeah, it could have been picking up that uh, like the, the CD that. problem, right? What we were talking about with wirelesses, because that's pretty common. CDs and wirelesses uh, are are often a problem when used together. But coming out of the earphone jack on a, uh, on a CD player, small Walkman type CD, usually works fine. I mean, it's a lot usually of, a lot not scratching. a problem. I mean, real, real high level scratching. Hmm. But you actually hear it. It probably was not the CD player. If you had, and he's right, if it was a wireless system plugged in anywhere, whether it was a handheld or a headset system, 90% of the time, it's the wireless picked up the frequency. We, we run a hall um, for one of our dances, and Pam does lines. And every so often, I have to turn off my CD player for her wireless system to work. I'll get that same noise. Just so close. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, it doesn't happen every night. 
and sometimes I maybe I move the CD player over here, and I've got the wireless system over here. But you know how we are. We, we take as little space as possible, and we, sometimes we want to get a three-foot table, and we've got it all piled up all over the place here. We've got cords laying over the place, and we've got this plugged over here and this plugged over here, and it's all laying on top of each other. Okay? But I have found out, and I, and I have. She'll be doing out there on the floor and pick up this one. I'll reach over and just kill the button on the CD player, and it's gone. They pick up signals. They pick it up. It probably wasn't the CD player at all. One other quick thought on that line is that if you are using uh, wireless mics, uh, and uh, wireless mics, you, you got to keep in mind that the, the receiver is sitting there hunting for a signal. It is just waiting for something for it to amplify. So if you have your own transmitter turned off, that doesn't mean anything to the receiver. It's still out there. It's got its ears wide open for something in that frequency range. Uh, the key thing that... Uh, I, I think in, in learning to use your equipment and everything, m almost all the, uh, in fact, as far as I know, all of the wireless microphone receivers have some sort of a LED indication when they're picking up a signal. If your transmitter is off and you're getting a little static or something, one of the first things you should do is go look at, if you're using a wireless, go look at your wireless and see if that transmit receives signal is, is, is starting to flash on a little bit. Because that's going to be an indication it's picking up a signal from somewhere. It may not necessarily be the uh, a CD that you're using. It might be a truck driver driving by or something, yeah, or the police station. It could be about anything. Uh, just picking up a little bit of a signal on that frequency. And that gets back to what Tom was saying. Leaving the antennas down is a great way to help eliminate that because it cuts down the uh, sensitivity of the receiver. The other quick cure of that is... Almost all of them have a squelch control. We don't need, it barely needs to be open, folks, for what we're doing. It just, it just has to come on. We don't need to open it up. A lot of times you can just almost turn it off, and everything we're using still works. Dick's right. You don't want any extra signals going in there. So eliminate as much of it as you can. Turn the squelch, back it off a little bit. You're not, you know. I, what I do when I set them up, I turn it off totally. I talk until I come on, and I don't move it again. I don't move it again. I, I don't want it doing any more than just getting me. They look at that as a volume control. <laughs> I, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you another secret. This is, this is where we got to we teach them. Here's the other thing I do. I don't mind giving them away. I open up every wireless wide open on the volume. I never change it. I open it wide open. I adjust the squelch almost totally off. And then every other control comes from this box up here. That's the only knobs I want anybody touching. I have more control then. Okay? So all my, I want it to happen right up here. I don't want people messing around the back of things. So I turn everything off or all the way on. And make them use everything up here. Real quick, Bob Asp, um, touch on patch cords. Um, you get so many different patch cords out there. You've got the gold plated, you got the silver plated, you got the stereo plated, and that's the, and the, the little lines in there for the stereo and that stuff. Um, and you get these different callers that are out there saying, "Well, you've got to use a stereo for mine." Well, I ran into a one the other day that. My, I use a patch cord to my, my uh, um, computer, plugged it into his Hilton, and it didn't work. But I just took it out the night before and used it in my, my Hilton. It worked just fine. But, so can you touch a little bit on the difference? Is there a difference sound quality or, you know, go with that route? Not particularly sound quality. Uh, the thing is matching up to the connector you're going into. Um, uh, if, uh, if you're using any type of a laptop, mini disc, um, iPod, any of those, they're, they're all stereo. They're all going to have a stereo connector on it. Uh, the most common one is the, uh, what we generally refer to as 8 pants. Uh, the true definition is a 3.5 millimeter. Uh, and so whatever you're plugging into your, your laptop, your iPod, that you should use a stereo plug on that. Uh, that's number one. Number two is then on the other end of whatever you're plugging into. I have always found it 
totally fine to take that stereo signal, tie the two together, and go into the, um, uh, if you have an older type system where it's a, a mono input and it's got a quarter inch mono plug or an RCA plug, uh, just tying the left and right together and then going into it. The, the main reason to do that is if on your recording, you, um, if you have a true stereo recording uh, that you've got, uh, to make sure you pick up all the music, uh, you want to pick up both the left and right channels. But I have found absolutely no problem with tying them together on the other end where it plugs in. I, I've never seen it hurt anything. Right. Now, the, the newer systems, the, the jacks are all stereotype jacks, so you can either plug in a stereo or a mono and they'll work. And another, oh, I had one other quick thought while we were talking about wireless mics. Uh, because this is uh, talking about sound and setting up sound at conventions also, uh, a real big thing is when you, you start doing festivals, boy, it gets, uh, it gets pretty hairy, as Tom will tell you, because all of a sudden now you don't have to worry about just one wireless mic, but you've got to worry about wireless mics in maybe five different halls. Uh, boy, making sure that you've got um, different frequencies and frequencies that don't interfere with each other. If you're working with one brand of wireless mic, typically the mic manufacturers offer uh, charts that show which ones they recommend to be used together. Or the other option is have a mix of UHF and VHF. Uh, that's a great way because they're far enough away from each other frequency-wise. They're not going to interfere. But particularly if you're doing festivals, boy, it's a, and, and then the danger there is, uh, which is very common, uh, you've done your job. You've made sure you've got five different frequencies, everything set up great, and the next thing you know, the instructor walks in and says, here's my wireless mic. I can only work with my wireless mic. And who knows if they're on the same frequency as one of the other halls or not. So you, you just got to be forewarned and prepared for that type of thing. <coughs> any other questions, Bob? Yeah, is there anything other than needle change on that Hilton stuff that I can, that I'm able to do? Uh, not really. The only real thing you need to do is if you are using records a lot is your main music source, go ahead and clean the bottom of the platter and the, and the drive wheel. Those are the key things. The maintenance role is, is yeah, that pretty thing. much. Uh, if you have a specific problem, I mean, that's what uh, Tom yeah. and myself are for, is uh, you, whether you're working with your yak stack or your whatever equipment, just give us a call. There are a couple things. When this Hilton comes to you, it has a piece of foam back here <laughs> on this arm, and it has a piece of foam underneath, and it has a piece of foam on top. Don't lose them. Don't throw them away. They're not packing material. It's very, very, very important to put that foam piece back here and underneath here every single time you pack this up. The top piece is shipping material. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't use that. Wouldn't want to use that and close up my equipment and leave it every time. It will flatten this out. Okay. Now, if you're going to ship it to some place for repair or whatever you're going to do, yeah, it's okay to have it there. But night after night after night after night, no, you don't want that big inch and a half, whatever it is, sitting on here. But you do want these others. Get If you're not in the habit, get in the habit. You don't need this thing rotating in the back of your car and spinning around. You don't need all this jiggling going on on this tone arm. These are expensive. Now, they almost last forever. Okay? Uh but there are expensive to replace. Now, Dick says, hey, if you, don't, you want the phone, go ahead and throw it away. <laughs> I'll send you another one. You know. But they're very important. That is part of maintenance with this piece of equipment. The other thing is, how many of you only use mic number one? Yeah. What's wrong with number two? Cure. Cure. What if they don't? What if, you're, what, what if you're the only caller, the only time plugging in that thing? All that? Guess what's going to happen one of these days when you get ready to go into number two? Mm -hmm. It ain't going to work. Why? I, it's not corrosion. It's um, you know, this, yeah, yeah. Alternate from time to time. Use this this week. Next week, use number two. 
Okay. Get him oh, in I, half I, of the, I can't call him. on number two. I don't want really to check that out. Get him. Get, get him. Uh, that's very bad. Get, get in the habit of, you know, of the other thing. You're talking about maintenance. It doesn't hurt to twist these knobs up here that says base and treble. It doesn't hurt to twist them. Use them. If you want to call it part of maintenance, call it part of the maintenance. I am in the habit. Yeah, you know, I'll set them over here a little bit from time to time. But you want to turn those things ever so often. You want to turn, even if you're not using the number two mic, turn the knob every once in a while. You know, I guarantee you I'm not the only person sitting up here with my thumb doing this all night long and find out it's not even plugged in. <laughs> I'll bet you I'm not the only caller. Okay? And you over here once in a while and use this one over here. Okay? Do some of that. Just a couple other quick thoughts on that. Uh, also, if you, uh, it, it, Tom's right, you want to use your whole system. That includes if you have a sound system that has a monitor channel, periodically plug in and make sure the monitor's still working. Also, getting back to the whole idea of having backup equipment, like Tom started uh, earlier in this, uh, if you have a backup amplifier, occasionally at one of your club dances, pull it out and use it for the club dance so you make sure everything's working right. There's the last time, the, the worst thing in the world is to be carrying around a, a, a flat spare tire, and it's the same thing with the sound system. If you if it's if it's developed a problem from bouncing around in the trunk of your car, the last time you want to find, the, the worst time to find out that problem is there is when you need it for what it's, you're carrying it for. So periodically, just uh, at club dances, um, I make sure uh, at my club dances, I just periodically use, uh, the. I, I carry around an old uh, backup experimental set that we had, and, that's, and I periodically just pop it out and use it for a dance, make sure everything's working right. Same with, thing with cords. Um, I have two different mic cables, and I will periodically switch back and forth between the two to make sure that everything's working good. I wanted to mention one thing that Tom was saying with the foam and everything. Uh, he's right. If you the, the top piece on the foam that we send out with the shipping, if you leave that on there over time, if it's a tight fit and it does vary on different sets, it will push down the, the, the gray foam, which is a bad thing because what happens is the 45 adapter is actually sitting up higher than the foam and your record can slide underneath it. So don't do that, number one. The other thing is over time, if the uh, pad that goes under the platter has gotten oil and grease on it, Call me and let me send you another one and throw that one away. Because what happens is you can go in there, clean your bottom of your platter and your drive wheel and everything, and then you put that greasy piece of foam back on there, and guess what? It's right back on the platter. So uh, just be aware of that. I, uh, if it's getting old and, 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 and uh, dirty and greasy, throw it away and then just give me a call and we'll send you another one. Along the lines of using the two mic inputs, most of the amps have two amps. You're aware there's a monitor, and you never use it except when you want to go to tandem? Not such a good idea. Use the other monitor channel once in a while for your speakers and your system and your dances. Just switch back and forth from time to time. Don't always stay on the main. One of these days you're going to want that monitor, and it doesn't work. You're going to be in big trouble. Switch back and forth. You paid for the whole system. Use. Hey, when I go on a golf course, I use the entire golf course. Right to left. Okay. If I'm going to pay the money for this thing, I'm going to use the whole system. Real quick, I agree using your mic 2, but when you use mic 2 and nobody's in mic 1, make sure your controls are hooked into mic 1 because you're... If the remote not, volume. Your remote yeah. volume. Yeah, on the newer systems, right? It won't work. I'm running into that. Yeah, you were turning that knob all night, right, Bob? No. Yeah. <laughs> No, but uh, no, he's right. Uh, the, the, on all of our newer systems, the, the, the remote volume uh, input only works when you have a second one plugged in. Bob? I know I'm not the only one who's ever done this. Leave Sounds the like the start of a good story, Bob. The start of a good story. Left the dance at 11 o'clock. Drove three hours home. Shut the switch off and leave the equipment in the trunk. Good idea, bad idea. 
Uh, it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, I know people in, in Alaska and some of our Canadian callers who live in very cold climates, they leave it in the trunk, it doesn't hurt anything. The only problem you can run into is uh, if it's been there and, and you're in a really cold climate and you bring it in, you have the same situation as, as a glass of water. You can, you can have condensation forming on, on because the equipment's so cold. And what happens then is the water can cause problems internally in a set. So uh, a, a couple of things to get around that is if you get to the dance early enough, just set it up and then give it a chance to warm up to warm con uh, room conditions. People that live in really cold climates, some of them I know, they just, uh, when, when they're ready to head out to the dance, they'll put the, uh, uh, their amplifier in the uh, in, in, in where they are uh, in the body of the car so right. that uh, it, it warms up a little bit. So when they carry it into the dance, it's not totally cold. Does it hurt anything leaving in the trunk? No. Would I do it? No, because I don't trust my neighbors in the well, neighborhood. Yeah. And I, you get into a whole other thing. I've talked over the years. That's one of the things I'm sure Tom and I can both tell you horror stories of people that have, uh, have had equipment stolen out of their car, and sometimes oh, yeah. it's their car parked in their driveway. I knew I wasn't the only one that had done that. But it's, it's um, the other thing, uh, it depends somewhat on your age of your equipment, too. I had a, a 300 that had a, a little bit of age on it, and when I lived in Ohio, it just didn't want to warm up real good when I got to the dance. And I did learn to put it in the car, you know, up front with me. Uh, but, you know, you've got, you got to know your equipment, uh, you know. Make sure you put a seatbelt on it, you know, that type of thing. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is monitors. A lot of guys are starting to use monitor speakers and what have you. Don't get in the trap of adjusting the monitor to sound great to you, and yet you've got a totally different sound going to the crowd. You know, I, that, that's a real, uh, I think, a, a problem for some callers. They're up there, man, they're making, they're really just those knobs on the monitor speaker that's right there on the table or wherever they want it, man, they got, ding, and it has nothing to do with what the dancers are hearing. Don't get in that trap. You know, I, if I'm going to have to have the monitor speaker, I typically plug it in in my normal system so that no matter what I got, going to the floor is coming through that one. That's a preference to me. All I'm suggesting is don't get caught in the trap of making everything, if you are doing them separate, making everything up here end up being totally different than what the dancers are getting. Make yourself sound good. That's good to me. Yeah. Well, I'm, just, I'm just full of questions. <laughs> <laughs> does, does anybody else want to ask Sam anything before Bob jumps back in? No, go ahead, Bob. On the new microphones, I noticed they, uh, there for a while they took the bass roll-up off of them, and now they're coming back out and put the bass roll-up on the new microphones in these. And what is the advantage or disadvantage of that, or any significance whatsoever? Uh, personally, it, it, it's such a minor change it, in my experience that it's it's so minor. You know, if you want to flip the switch, great. Uh, going back a few years, uh, for those of us that have called a few years, um, we used to, I used to use a, an AKG D1200 or D1000. That had a three-position switch that actually did something. It changed the frequency response of the microphone. Uh, and I found that, like, if I had a cold and I was a little stuffy, I'd make sure it was over on the sharp setting. Uh, when I went and called for people that had never heard me before, first tip, I would start off with it in the sharp setting because that's going to give them maximum clarity of, of hearing my voice. Once they're used to it, then I can bump it over more toward the bass. Uh, that all being said, the Electro Voice um, uh, bass roll-off switches are such a minor roll-off, I, I, they're, they're kind of a placebo switch as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if yeah, Tom, Tom agrees. Well, you know, everybody says, I've got to have one who's got that on there, you know. Oh, sure. And if it, if it makes you happy, that's great. No. <laughs> to each their own. Any other questions? Well, actually, according to my uh, Sunbeam uh, time clock here, uh, we're right at 12 o'clock. So, are we? 12 o'clock is quitting time for us, isn't there? Are we? Going? Okay. 12:15. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate. It. I hope you uh, hope you got something out of it.